name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com. Our special guest tonight is, um, is guitarist, lead singer um, Randy Jackson from the band Zebra. And tonight, Randy, you're being interviewed for our Remembering Ronnie Mantra special. And um, I understand that you played this year's event. Um, is this the first time you played the um, Ronnie Mantra's um, Remembered concert event? Yes, it is. And uh, it was funny, I uh, just met Keith St. John uh, for the first time last year, and uh, we became friends, and uh, he, I told him I was going to be out at the NAMM show, and he told me he would, he'd been doing this show for a couple of years and asked me if I wanted to do it, so I was excited to do it because I was a uh, big Montrose fan. Zebra covered uh, Rock Candy when we first started out in 1975, and uh it was uh, one of our favorite songs to do. So. Wow, yeah, and you know, um, from what, um, for anybody who doesn't know, Key St. John, he's um, one of the very last singers Ronnie um, worked with before he died, and um, Key St. John is um, the guy that's been putting on this annual event for, I think it's for the last four or five years, called Ronnie Montrose Remembered, where he gets a lot of the guys like himself that played with Ronnie or um, people like you that were influenced by him. Now, um, for, for us, Randy, share, um, you, you mentioned Rock Candy and the fact that your band Zebra covered that song in the early days. Now, um, how exactly, what's the story of how um, you became a Montrose fan? Was it that first album, like a lot of us, you know, back in 1973? Well, I mean, it's strange. We had a, our lighting uh, director back in 75 when we first started off was also a DJ at a club called Opus 111 in New Orleans. And it was kind of a hip place to hang out. Uh -huh. And it was brand new. And they would play some dance music, but they also played some heavy, heavy rock. And we'd go in there and hear this song, Rock Candy. And it just was like, just had the most awesome riff. And the production was just great. And the vocals were just outstanding. But you could dance to it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so... You know, it was just an obvious choice for us to, since we were trying to figure out what kind of covers to do, to add that to the list. And uh, it was, uh, I think it was, you know, our visits to Opus 111, and uh, I asked James, I said, who is this band? James was our lighting guy. He said, yeah. oh, this is Montrose, you know? And, uh, you know, so that was that was how I got introduced to, uh, you know, Ronnie Montrose and the first Montrose record, so. Yeah, and I'll give you a little bit of trivia, Go, um, going back to that first album, um, what a lot of people don't know is, um, as great of a guitar player and songwriter Ronnie was, you know, they had their own great original material, but he also did a great uh, job of taking other people's material and covering those songs and kind of really rocking them up and making them his own. There's actually a, a cover tune on that first album. Do you have any idea which uh, of those songs that I'm talking about? No, nope, no. Nope. Okay, oddly enough, it would be Good Rockin' Tonight, and... Um, for, for all these years myself, I, I believe that to be an original Montrose tune until I did some research, and I come to find out that that was originally an Elvis tune back in the 50s, and you can check it out on yeah. YouTube, and um, oddly enough, it was more of a rockabilly tune, and he really rocked uh -huh. that up, you know, um, but but he, uh, and then he, uh, if you go to the Paper Money album, which was a final album with Sammy Hagar, they've got a song on there called Connection, which is a great um, cover of a Rolling Stones tune. That's funny. I mean, when, well, when we got to New York and started playing Rock Candy, a lot of people thought it was our song. Wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it works both ways. You know, they said, yeah, I thought that Rock Candy was your song. No, 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 no. Not at all. That's and and through your career, Randy, do you ever cross paths with Ronnie or had the uh, opportunity to meet him? Never. I never got to meet him. Uh, you know, I know a lot of uh, people that have played with yeah. him and uh, knew him and... Uh, Everybody always had great things to say about him, and uh, you yeah, know, just yeah. from the YouTube videos that yeah. I see, it looks like he always had a great time on stage and really enjoyed what he was doing right up to the end. You yeah, know? it's interesting you bring up YouTube because one of the guys I interviewed for this, I forget who it was, but he was t telling me, you know, if, if you um, go on YouTube and you research um, Montrose, um, you'll find stuff from like later in his career and maybe shortly before he died, but um, you won't find a lot of. Uh, classic clips of Montrose from back in the day just because um, they didn't videotape a lot of stuff back then. Right, there's audio out there. Yeah, yeah. There's not a whole lot of video. Yeah. 
And um, I was curious, um, in your lengthy career, did you ever cross paths with Sammy Hagar or any of other guys in Montrose? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we actually toured with Sammy uh, in 1984 on his last solo tour before he Joined Van uh, went with Van Halen. Yeah, And uh, Sammy treated us great. I remember there was one time uh, when uh, it's kind of in the middle of the tour where uh, his road crew was getting a little lackadaisical about getting there on time, <laughs> and we weren't getting sound checks because of it, you know? They were yeah. late setting up, and we were like, just have to set up and go with a line check, and he heard about it, and he came out one day unannounced and just chewed them a new asshole uh, <laughs> over the fact that they were getting there late, and <laughs> that that, you know, why do you think we have Zebra opening up for us? It's not so they can sound shitty. <laughs> we could do that with any band. Wow, we wow. want the crowd to be revved up. You know, I mm. mean, great businessman, and, and uh, you know, he took care of us. You know, I really, I'll never forget that. And um, getting back to the Ronnie Montrose Remembered um, event that you played, um, I guess now about a month or so ago, um, what were the songs you got to play on? The song I played was... Um, uh, make it last. Oh, that's another great tune. Wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was very cool. And, uh, and, and, and um, I understand you got to, um, Keith St. John was one of the guys you got to perform with that night? Yeah, Keith, yeah. uh, Keith sang that song, uh, that night, mm. and, um, you know, the whole band was, was great. Uh, Sean was on bass, and, um, who was it, uh, playing drums? He was just freaking awesome, uh, well, we look, we, uh, people could look that up, but but I will tell you. See, that's the yeah. cool thing about that event is um, what I dig about the event is it, it's put on by um, you know Keith, well, Keith St. John is the organizer behind it, the promoter. But then he gets these other guys like himself that played with Ronnie. You know, so these are people that have had a real love for Ronnie Montrose. They played with oh, the yeah. man. They personally knew him. And then you got other guys um, like you. You you know came up on the scene with Ronnie. You were you were greatly influenced by the guy. And, and it shows it shows the guy's legacy because um, I started interviewing people for this remembering Ronnie Montrose thing we're doing here uh, as far back as um, 2013, and we're getting ready to wrap it up and start posting interviews. And, and the amazing thing to me is, like a lot of people, um, I thought Montrose was just like those first two albums, and come to find out, there's all this great material that came later that a lot of people aren't even aware of. And that's yeah. a great thing about being part of an event like that. I mean, they go all all the way back to when he was in the Edgar Winter Group, covering when he was in, um, I think, even Van Morrison. I mean, I had no idea until just recently. Um, uh, one of my all-time favorite songs, "Free Ride." What a great classic rock tune! How could oh, yeah. I not know Ronnie Mach was as the guitar player on that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, rock and roll crosses many paths, and many people cross paths in it. And uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, really interesting history to it. Uh, yeah. Certainly, Ronnie. It was a huge, huge part of it. You know, yeah. uh, the thing about one thing about that song. I mean, when Zebra first started uh, in uh, back in 1975, uh, you know, we we probably did something like we had probably over 200 songs cover yeah. tunes that wow. we did. I mean, we were doing our own stuff too, but we covered a lot of different bands. And it's been you know 44 years now, and there's a handful of songs that yeah. we still perform, and Rock Candy is, is one of them. And, 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 and I mean, we, <laughs> we covered, like, so many different people, but that one has stood the test of time. And, and, and you know, especially back back in the day when you were first starting out, I mean, um, that's one of those tunes that even today, 40 years later, people hear all the time on the radio, but, you know, back in the day when you guys were just starting out, probably a lot of people were like, yeah, hey, I've heard that song on the radio. Um, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know... Um, I don't know the name of the band, but that's one of those tunes yeah, that people and, hear, you know? and they didn't really play it much on the radio in New Orleans. We didn't hear it on the radio yeah. in New Orleans. We heard it in this nightclub, you know? And then when we got to New York, I don't even know if I heard it up here, and I think that's why when we played the Long Island Circuit, people yeah. kind of thought it was our song, because they weren't hearing it as much on the radio as you might be, it might have been hearing out out west and stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, but eventually it became, you know... Yeah, huge. And, and um, you know, yeah. through talking to Keith St. John, um, what's interesting is he was telling me that, um, you know, he was one of the last guys to um, actually work with Ronnie before he died. And um, he said, interestingly enough, um, because he's, he's a little bit younger, 
Um, he didn't really hear any of the Montrose stuff until he, until he started actually working with Ronnie. So he was even a Montrose fan. He had to kind of learn the stuff from that perspective. And um, and then he was sharing me in regards to the Ronnie Montrose event this year. He said, I've been a huge Zebra fan all these years. And then I actually um, was fortunate enough to um, meet Randy Jackson. We got talking and, and he, he said, you know, how you agreed to be part of the event. He said, man, I was so honored that he wanted to be part of this. But like you said, it, it's kind of interesting that how things come full circle, you know? Yeah. You just you never know. You just never know. And, and, and Keith we, actually was born here on Long Island, yeah. you know, but moved, moved to California years and years and years ago. But uh, yeah, he he grew up just not too far from where I live here in, uh, in New York, you know? Yeah, and, you know, we're talking about a guy that's been doing this as long as you have now, um... Randy, when a guy like Keith comes up to you, you know, who's a little bit younger than you, um, um, how surprised are you to hear that, you know, you and your band Zebra had that kind of influence on somebody? Well, it's all, it's always flattering, you know, yeah. I mean, when we started off, you know, way back in the day, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen, you mm -hmm. know, but you, the last thing you're thinking of is how, what, who you're going to be influencing. You're just open, you know, you get some fans to like your music and come see you, but, uh, when uh, one of them turns out to be a really successful musician, it's it's uh, it's very flattering. And then you know? um, I was reading a little history on your uh, on you guys, and I understand that um, actually Zebra was originally. Uh, I guess the guy that signed you was Jason Flom, and he he was with Atlantic Records. He's the same guy, I think, that signed Twisted Sister. And and um, I understand you're a pretty big Led Zeppelin fan, and that's the label, you know, yeah. also for ACDC and Led Zeppelin. So that had to be a huge. Um, uh, a, a huge, huge thing for you guys when, to get signed by Atlantic Records. Yeah, it was it was awesome. You know, I mean, to to see that label that I had watched spend so many times on a Led Zeppelin or Yes, yeah, you know, or so many other great bands, and to see that label on the record, you know, with Zebra on it was uh, it was. What a thrill for me, you know. And, and of we course, you know, the label, music so. industry was a lot different back day. I mean, those were the days when you still. Um, you know, you're lucky if you even have a record label these days, and um, it's only guys that are in legendary acts like you um, that, that really got a label behind them these days. But um, what was your story as far as how you guys got your first um, record deal? Did somebody see you in a club? Did you send a demo to the comp record company? Well, it was, you know, we had tried the demo route, and we had a couple of managers uh, here on Long Island, and nothing panned out. Mm -hmm. uh, we were always being told that the material was good, but it wasn't, like up to date uh -huh. like if we'd have come out 10 years earlier yeah. we'd have had a better chance yet we were doing the circuit here and packing the clubs yeah. and uh there was a uh a guy named bob buckman who was a program director here at a radio station wbab and he's actually a good friend of keith's you know okay. out as a matter of fact bob introduced me to keith last year okay out wow. in, uh, when zebra was playing the whiskey but uh, but Bob was the program director at WBAB, and he liked the, the band. And when we made these demos, he said, he, "Would you mind if I played them on the station?" And make a long story short, he started put he put them into uh, regular rotation, and they became some of the most requested songs at the station. So when uh, when Jason Flom from Atlantic went to the station to talk to Bob about some other business, Bob was just <laughs> adamant about you know. Forget about whatever you're thinking about zebras. What you should be worrying about, yeah. because you know they've got the top five requests at the station, and uh, you know you got ACDC and and uh, Led Zeppelin are like number seven and number eight here, yeah. and so Jason was like, "Well, how could that possibly be?" And he says, <laughs> "Well, they don't have a record deal. This is the only place people can hear the stuff, and they really like them." So. That, that, yeah, that, that helped a lot towards us getting signed, you know. And, and I, it really gives the band some kind of a real, real major street, you know, cred in the sense that um, at the time you weren't even on a label and there was that kind of buzz about you, about you guys. Um, yeah. From people in the industry we were already. Big, you know? We were a huge bar band. <laughs> we, were, we were on this circuit out here with Twisted Sister and you could play out here like five nights a week and put 1,000 to 3,000 people in a club every night of the week. I, crazy yeah, I see stuff on Twisted Sister, like you said, they were very, very another band, very big on the um, New York um, club scene back in the day. And a lot of people make jokes about um, Twisted Sister. I mean, they're, they're another band after forty years, finally called it, a, you know, finally called it a day. And people kind of yeah. think they're a joke band, but you know, they've lasted forty years, so you know, they they build up this huge oh, yeah. fan base. So 
there's somebody out there buying this stuff and, and to kind of think that um you know at one point their biggest selling album was that stay hungry album but then um years later when they got back together um probably i think the album was sold even more now the christmas album which is kind of funny for yeah but but it, it speaks a lot about their fan base you know still out there supporting them yeah, and they work hard, and uh, you know, Dee Snyder's one of the greatest frontmen in rock and roll. I can tell you that he's uh, he works his butt off. You never see a show where he's like laid back. So, and the fans know it; and they appreciate it. So, uh, and so I whatever. imagine. Um, did you guys Negative ever play stuff, any they shows? They have to say about twisted. Yeah. You know, they they rock. You know, did you guys ever play any shows with them? Oh yeah, yeah, we played with Twisted. Was one of the first bands we ever played with when we got to New York, and. Uh, it was great because we we were nobody and we came up and uh, they had a, a big following yeah. and we got to open up for their crowd and of course uh, you know it helped a lot you yeah. know every band we got to open up for up, up here you know gave us a lot of exposure and uh, you know it, yeah. it really helped a lot and we became good friends oh, wow. been friends yeah. over the years and yeah. so um, I was reading that you're originally from I think Louisiana so um, was it your desire to um, make it in the music business that originally brought you to New York? Yeah. I mean, we didn't think we were going to get a record deal by staying in yeah. New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, We definitely either had to go to Los Angeles or New York. And we knew somebody in New York, so we, we came up here and gave it a shot. And so what was that What was that transition like for you, going from Louisiana to New York? I mean, I imagine the two are quite different um, places to live. <laughs> Well, they're they're not they're not as different as you'd think, except that when we came up, it was the dead of winter oh, wow. when we yeah. came to New York, and it was like the tundra up here. It was one of the worst winters uh, that they had, and and have had since. It, it, we just hit it at a at a bed. It was the uh, winter of 1977, and it was just brutal. And um, but you know, we made it through the first couple of months. Mm -hmm. We went back to New Orleans uh, and made some more money to support ourselves back in New York and we came back again uh, in May and stayed through the summer and by the end of the summer we were making enough money up here in New York to where we didn't have to go back down to New Orleans if we didn't you know if we didn't want to and we were able to focus on just uh, writing and you know doing what we came up here to do and that was to get the record deal. And so once you had your record deal in hand I, I got to ask you um, how long was it to um, get that debut album made and, and released? I think it was probably took nine months between the time we started it and released it. You know. Yeah, and they, you know, you hear people say, you know, when a band goes in to cut their debut album, you know, you've kind of had your whole life that, that you know, like many uh, many years you've trained behind some of these songs. Yeah. And um, so, did you already have a lot of tunes already written when you went in to record? Oh yeah, I mean, we had the whole record done. You know, we we had been playing the songs for. Uh, you know, some of them for eight years at that point. You wow, know? wow. And I, I got to ask a you, lot I, of stuff I love, that, yeah. that, that didn't get on the first record that we put on the second record. Yeah. You know? So we had a lot of material. So that, that's the good first, in a sense, no shortage of material, but you, you guys definitely um, are on the way up, you know. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, we had a lot for the first and the second. And then the third record, I wrote most of that on the road while we were on the road for the uh, second record. Uh, but I'm really proud of that record because the third record is really, the, to me, the most cohesive record. It sounds like uh, it's you can tell it's a, it's an album. It's an album of songs that was written with a theme behind them musically and lyrically. Yeah. So, and I, I always love to ask guys, Randy, like in your case, how did you? It's interesting name. I know uh, coming up with a band name is always a very hard thing. But um, Zebra on the surface, you kind of ask, oh, okay, how did they come up with the name like Zebra? Yeah, we. Um, we needed a name because yeah. we were we were just rehearsing at a certain point and we weren't really quite ready to go out and perform. But I had a friend of mine who, who had a sorority and she was desperate to get a band because the band they had for their <laughs> dance had canceled at the last minute and she knew that I had a band and we were working. She called me and said, would you please, please, we can't get anybody. And it was like, it was like a couple of days away. So I talked to Felix and Guy, and we said, yeah, let's go do it. So we, But we didn't want to go there without a name. Yeah, so yeah. we met at a bar, met at a bar in uptown New Orleans. And, and uh, eventually, uh, we just, there was a picture of a zebra up above where we were sitting. And uh, <laughs> we said, let's call it zebra. There it is on the wall. So that's how it happened. 
How cool and simple at the same time. Um, as far as the zebra logo, um, did somebody in the band design that, or did you have somebody from a record company come up with that? It depends on what logo you're talking about. The, oh. Oh, oh the, 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 the one that's kind of just block letters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That that was the record company that did that. Oh, okay. For the first record. Yeah, that's. I think that's the logo you're talking. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. You know, kind of standard things people see on the zebra stuff. Yeah. And we had several logos before that, but I, yeah. that one, that one was kind of cool the way they they did it. You know, and yeah. And now, um, you know, back in the even today, there's not a lot of um a lot of great trios. I mean, only a couple come to mind. Like um, obviously, you can think of Grand Funk, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, um, Cream. Now, um. My question is, like, did you guys ultimately um, set out that we're just going to be a three-piece band? Were you originally going to have another guy playing guitar? Or how, how did you decide to be a three-piece band? Well, we were actually looking for a singer in the beginning. Okay. We were going to be four-piece. Yeah. And either the singers, we would audition singers, and they weren't any good, or... The singers didn't want to sing with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't think they didn't think we were any good, and uh, all three of us were able to sing. Uh -huh. So, you know, when this gig came up, like I told you about, where we had to get the name, we went out and played, and it seemed to go okay. So, I think from there we just kind of said, let's just see how we do with it as three piece, and that kind of threw us into the three piece. And, and like mode, like you know? like you said, you guys could all sing. But my uh, my next question would be like, I I I uh, understand that you started like taking lessons as far as piano lessons and guitar lessons as far back as five years old. So did you start out, you know, primarily thinking of yourself as um, like a piano player and a guitar player? And did you always kind of know you, you could sing or did you not really think well, of yourself much as a singer? Not, I mean, I knew I could sing a little bit, but I never really envisioned myself uh -huh. as a singer. Um, and when, you know, the band before I was in before Zebra, uh, band called Shepherd's Bush I was in with Felix, our bass player. Oh, okay. He was the lead singer. It was his band. Oh, so, wow, wow. Reversal. You know, I was just singing background. Uh -huh. and, yeah. And, 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 uh, and so once Zebra started to take off, uh, that'd be my next question is, um, you know, for you thought of yourself a lot as a guitar player, but um, did that take any adjusting um, in your mind? Okay, I'm now the front man. I'm the lead singer and the guitar player. A lot of people are going to have, you know, be focusing on me. Well, it was a slow, you know, progression towards that. Because uh -huh. when we first got together, like I said, we played 200 covers. I mean, yeah. and they were by different bands. And, you know, we were all singing, taking turns singing lead, you know, like yeah. Guy would sing the Deep Purple. Oh, cool. Da Guy had a really high, big, rich voice, you know, to hit, you know, like the Ian Gillen stuff, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, we... We all shared, like, the Led Zeppelin a little bit in the beginning, you know, d yeah. depending on what song it was. Felix would sing the Stones and Aerosmith. Uh, I was doing the Beatles. And, uh, you know, I mean, and I could just go on and on yeah, with, yeah. All, we, 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 with all the different bands. But eventually, you know, when I would write a song, I'd be singing the song. And uh, Felix and Guy would do the harmonies. So... Uh, and eventually I started taking on more of the Led Zeppelin songs. Okay, okay. Uh, and so, and and when we got to New York, fans were asking for more of the Led Zeppelin. Can you do more Zeppelin? So we started adding more Zeppelin to the repertoire wow. as we were adding the, the uh, original. So I think it was kind of a slow progression that I became the lead singer, quote-unquote singer, because that was not the way it was when we first started off. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. And now, um, I, I was kind of interested to ask, um, so for, for many years when uh, you guys were just starting out, Zebra's really um, taken off and um, got, a, got a pretty big following. What was the point, um, uh, and, and what led to the band ultimately disbanding for a few years before you decided to get back together? Well, you know, people think we disbanded, but we never did. Oh, okay. We have played gigs every single year for 44 years. Wow, wow, okay, okay. Never, never stopped. The only time that we did have a little break was when our drummer, Guy, got breast cancer back in 1997. Oh, wow, okay. And we, <laughs> and we still played. We had uh, our good friend Bobby Roninelli, plus a couple of other drummers, filled in for him to do some gigs during that time while he healed up, but... Uh, 
that was the only time we ever took a break, and even that wasn't really a break. You know, talk, no talk about but, talk about rock and roll myth, because I mean. Um, you know, I, even in re, um, doing some research to talk to you today about the band, um, I, of course, heard Zebra, and I know who you guys are, and followed you somewhat over the years, but, like, if you read anything up on, um, you know, the internet or anything, you, like, um, they'll say, oh, well, Zebra got back together, like, in 1996 or 97, and there was a demand sure. for, for a live album, so he put out a live <laughs> album, but that's kind so of interesting that you guys you, never I, really... I go to... Yeah. I go to gigs where, where they say or they'll call me doing an interview and the guy will introduce me as Randy Jackson formerly of Zebra <laughs> wow. as if we're not even together <laughs> and haven't been for a while it's, it's pretty funny you know yeah oh wow that, that, that's really really interesting and then I um, I was also reading that um, around I think it was 1992 um, you started um, doing solo shows and doing some of these acoustic shows and um you were also involved with, um, I guess at the time would have been, I mean, it's pretty commonplace now, but um, a lot of, where a lot of bands use computers and stuff for making music, that you invented something yeah. called the, um, some kind of software called the Key, which is a multi instrument Talk a little bit about that. Oh, uh, yeah. The Key was uh, an interactive musical instrument, and, you know, the, I got brought in because I had a pretty good knowledge of MIDI at the time. And, uh, <laughs> Wow. So I was in charge of doing a lot of musical programming and helping design the instrument. And um, it uh, it worked really well. You could play it as a standalone instrument. So wow. it wasn't just like a karaoke guitar. And we, yeah. we had a couple people that, that liked it and liked the fact that it was an easy instrument to play. So we had uh, John Anderson from Yes, um, we got we had got a couple to him and he loved it so much he he actually used to write seven songs on one of his solo records back then. I mean, talk about being uh, at the forefront of technology. I mean, uh, like I said, that's commonplace today as far as um, people using software and stuff, you know, for stage lights and making music. A lot, of, a lot of um, you really don't need to even have a professional studio to, to um, cut an album these days, which is kind of interesting. Now, um, in regard to the key. Did you just work mm -hmm. at the company, or do you have um, do you own any of a copyright regarding that, or any kind of ownership behind that? Um, I had I had a they made me a partner in it, but I don't own any of the patents. Oh, okay. That's what you're asking. Well, yeah, because um, I'm just thinking again. You know, it's kind of commonplace for people to use um, computer software these days, but back then, I mean, that was fairly new thing. What's it like um, to no, you oh, were yeah. on the forefront they, of something like that. There were a lot of, there yeah. were one of the patents they, they came up with, I mean, it was while we were working on the project and yeah. the company owned the stuff, but yeah. uh, they were actually using <laughs> using it for earthquake detection, wow. <laughs> believe it or not, wow, wow. eventually, yeah. yeah. Because we were trying to figure out how to start uh, to play along with a CD, a pre-existing pre CD, mm -hmm. and synchronize it in perfect time. And so you needed to get to hear the very beginning of the CD. You're not reading digital data, you're just yeah. going to hear whatever it is. So wow. it was like, I remember, I think it was Dark Side of the Moon where that came up, because we, we had done that whole record. and So you've got the, the heartbeat coming in, and the low, low, and it's got to start exactly in the right place in order to synchronize the instrument to the CD. And we made it work, you know. We had a, uh, a mathematician who worked on, uh, you know, the Moon Project, actually. You know, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. And they hired him to come in, and he was doing all these calculations and stuff to figure out exactly how to do it. And uh, and it worked. I was like, wow. Yeah, I mean, Very cool. it kind of reminds me of um, Greg Jufria. He's a keyboard player from the band Angel. Um, yeah, sure. And, and you'd think that he'd make a lot of his, um, you know, living in the music, making money in the music industry off of, you know, Angel and his other bands. He, he became a huge millionaire, not off of music, but rather he created some kind of um, computer chip that they use in Las Vegas, um, you know, um, slot machines. And it's just kind of interesting that people... <laughs> You know, they, they, they get rich off of, you know, other things and besides their main um, way of making a living, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Sammy Hager, you know, in his book, he describes how he made a, a fortune on uh, similar things he invented, you know. Yeah, speaking of Sammy, I mean, again, um, I, um, talking a little bit about that, I read in his book, too, that um, when he originally joined Van Halen, he, he, um, his, his Cabo Wabo bar, he wanted to make the other guys in Van Halen a partner. They were, really weren't... Um, 
interested and then I guess years later they kind of um, regret not getting involved regret in that. Look at, <laughs> you could say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting that Sammy would go on to join Van Halen when you think, uh, getting back to Montrose for a minute because Montrose is kind of a um, blueprint for a band like uh, Van Halen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were, and, and they all were managed, you know, had the same management and the, the, and the production. Yeah, yeah. Produced, yeah. And, so uh, yeah. they all knew each other. And uh, so it was, a, it was an interesting, and I, I think it was a pretty natural mm -hmm. thing to happen, actually, you know, and think about it. And, and I, I know you've done, um, like I said, I know you performed as a solo artist too, Randy, but um, a lot of these days, you know, your, your primary gig is with um, Zebra. Did you ever have any desire to... Um, like, like be, um, do anything major outside of Zebra? Because um, I was also reading, interestingly enough, I didn't know about you, um, I think it was back in 1989, you got a call to tour um, as a guitar player with the original Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, yeah, did that for six months. Uh, they were in rehearsals, and they just didn't think, they, they, I actually played guitar, keyboards, and did some background vocals. <laughs> uh, they just didn't feel like the, it was... Uh, the music was full enough on on some of the songs, you know, because mm -hmm. they were covering a lot, a lot, a lot of material. And so, my friend Kenny Arnoff, who was playing drums, he was the only person that wasn't an original member okay. in this, uh, you know, form of the airplane. Recommended me, and wow. uh, I went out there and rehearsed with them for like a week and a half, and then we went on the road. I had a great time. I met people that I would have never met if I hadn't done that tour. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it was again, pretty you, interesting. Yeah. And again, you know, you know, your friend Kenny, but um, I imagine um, you must have been hugely influenced by those guys growing up. And what's that like to go? Oh, yeah. kind of um, go from the fan to you're actually on the stage with these guys now. Yeah, I mean, I was you know 11, 12 years old listening to them, and uh, you know, I remember listening to Plastic Fantastic Lover and. Uh, mm -hmm you know, trying to figure out what is this all about, you know, because yeah. that was psychedelic back then. That was before <laughs> Hendrix, you know. They were like, they were the thing, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, Jefferson Starship, they, they kind of uh, morphed into the band um, Starship, but um, I think, you know, Jefferson Airplane had more um, hits than Starship, interestingly enough, but... Um, that was also, the stuff I was more familiar with, you yeah, know, yeah. so... And um, I also saw on um, one of your websites, Randy, they had a trailer for a Zebra DVD. Now, is, um, I don't know how old that is. is, is um, are you guys working on a DVD? Is that in the works? Is that already? No, been? no, it's it's been out for fifteen years now. Okay, okay. It's called Z Zebra the DVD, and it's got a a little history of the band, and plus it's got uh, you know live tracks of us performing different places. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and uh, I know you guys are currently doing, doing you know constant um, constant touring. But is there anything else going on with the band? Like, uh, have you discussed the possibility of a new Zebra album or anything like that? I'm working on material right now. You know, I've, uh, last two weeks I've been culling the archives and uh, and uh, kind of putting together some stuff for a new record or some new songs anyway. And uh, we've also been doing. Uh, we we did our first show with a symphony orchestra in, uh, last year, oh, doing wow. Zebra songs, yeah. wow. and uh, we're going to do another one on on March thirtieth. So the, the first one went great, and we're hoping this one goes just half as well as the first one did, and that will be a success. You and, know? and let me ask you about the first one you did. Um, that was like you said a great success, but um, it must have been a lot of work, um, especially being the first time you've done a show like that um, with the band. Um, Talk a little bit about all the work and preparation that went into you know making a show like that, and then um, follow up question would be: um, Did you guys record it any chance that we might may have a CD DVD of that one day? We we did record it, and we did a like a multi camera shoot, and the recording came out great. And you know I've just been like slowly kind of going through you know, it, <laughs> going through the tracks and and checking stuff out and hearing how it was, but it, it really really was. Uh, great show and um, you know I'd been working do, with, this, with the orchestras for the past 24 years yeah, this yeah. was the first time Felix and Guy had done it and it was the first time we did it with zebra music you know wow. so it was a thrill for me and, and again you know I, I know years ago Deep Purple they, they put out like a, 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 con, a classical music thing uh, at the Royal Albert Hall uh -huh. um, kind of similar type of thing um, for you what was it like hearing um, zebra 
music kind of um, go into a symphonic mode, if you know what I mean, as opposed to your typical... Well, it was, it's, it was a natural progression. I mean, a lot of the zebra music uh, is orchestrated anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got the strings and the... You know, if you listen, especially the third zebra record, uh, <laughs> we uh, and then you listen to, like, on the second record, we got that song Lullaby, where there's just tons mm-hmm. of orchestration and counterpoint going on. So it's not too far of a stretch. It's not like, you know, you're having to all of a sudden create something for, yeah. for like when Metallica did it. You know, a lot of the stuff is already there. Oh, okay, okay. That's and, kind of the point I was trying to make. And um, have you ever, um, have you guys ever done like an unplugged show, like more like an acoustic thing? Yeah, there's there's pieces. We did a little show like that uh, for the live DVD. And if you got a hold of that, oh, you, uh, you would that. see some of that on there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did some of the songs like that. And, and um, I kind of think I know the answer to this already, but, um, you know, it seems like there's no slowing down for you guys. If, um, you, you talked at all about, like, some of these bands that are deciding to, you know, pack it up and call it a day, or you, one of these bands that are kind of like, we're just going to do it until we can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think, you know, most bands do it till they can't do it. Yeah. You know, it's usually health issues, and, uh, you know, we we get along with each other, so we don't have that we don't have that problem. So I think we'll be playing until uh, one of us drops. You know. Wow, wow, and um, that must be a great feeling because, like you're saying, um, especially a band that's been around for over forty years. I mean, it's not too often you talk to bands that where everybody doesn't um, you know hate each other. It's great that you can um, be together all these years and still be the best of friends. You know. Yeah, it's uh, you know we've become a family, so that's very fortunate. You know. And uh, rare, I think, <laughs> also yeah. in this business, you know. But uh, you know, it's always good to see the original members of any band get back together again. Uh, yeah. I think the fans really love it, you know. And and you've been talking a great deal about like um, influences, like Led Zeppelin and that, and um, and I know you were influenced by the Beatles. And matter of fact, talking about acoustic shows, I was reading on your website that you have a um, couple shows coming up, like paying tribute to both Led Zeppelin and the Beatles. Um, Talk a little bit about, obviously, these are your influences, but how you got the idea to do these shows and um, if there will be well, more. Well, th- yeah, I, th- I think one of the shows you're talking about, I just did it last night. And oh, it really okay, wasn't, okay. Yeah. It really wasn't a, a show about Led Zeppelin. It was me performing with another band who does Led Zeppelin. Oh, okay. But I wasn't playing. Oh, okay. I didn't play with the band. They, We just did a show together. Oh, okay. So I played... And I actually didn't play any Led Zeppelin. I steered away from it because they were going to be doing Led Zeppelin. So I didn't do any Zeppelin. And then when they played, I got up and did a couple of songs with them, you know. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. Wow. And uh, the the Beatle one will be a little different because that's a friend of mine who's got a a band uh, called Helter Skelter. And they do like a heavy version of the Beatles songs heavier than oh wow to. that would be a that yeah. would be a cool thing I, I could see a guy like you getting involved with that and you know a lot of people they, they scoff at the idea of like um, tribute bands but I tell you out here in LA where I'm from um, uh-huh. it, it's a pretty big thing the tribute scene and um, to me I like to think of it as rock and roll um, theater because there, there are bands that they just get up there and it's kind of to me more like a cover band they just kind of perform the tunes and that great that's great for that but I really dig the ones that like um, they, they dress the part like they, they, they dress the guy you can go see a Deep Purple yeah, they, tribute and the guy tries to look it. like Richie Blackmore and you actually yeah. think you're seeing Deep Purple you know <laughs> they're that good yeah exactly exactly yeah there's and there's a lot of great ones out there so yeah and, and you know you talk you know, about you know we're talking about that yeah. time in our lives where you can't see all those bands anymore and, uh, oh yeah you know so people people love to see the tribute bands come out and the, the better they do it the better they dress yeah, and even more interesting yeah. it is. And even like a band like you're talking about this Helter Skelter. Uh, I mean, the uh, um, Steve, there's how, how many Beatles tributes must there be out there? So, so number one, um, to get people's attention, people come to show, you got to have something kind of extra, a little special. So, not only yeah. not only do you dress dress apart, but like you're saying, okay, this band takes um, the Beatles and they do like heavier versions. People, yeah. metal, metal fans are gonna love that. This, oh man, I can't and. and even metal people, I think, can get into, um, or hard rock fans, I think, can get into the Beatles, because as a Beatles fan yourself, I mean, these were, these were great songs, they've stood up, uh, for tremendous, great, yeah. great songwriters, and um, yep. anytime you got great songs like that, even a band like Queen, that's why you could never replace Freddie Mercury, you know, let's be honest, but yeah. I, that's why Roger and Brian are still able to go out and do those songs, 
because they just got a great catalog of music and if you get a decent enough singer that can perform those tunes people are going to come to the show just to because like you said these are either songs they grew up on or even kids today that just hearing these songs for the first time you know 30 40 years later but they're still just as great as when we heard them for the first time you know sure great music survives you know it's amazing that you know that rock and roll has like survived this long in such a grand fashion too it's yeah, pretty and, awesome and that's why even a band like zebra that you guys have had your ups and downs but the fact that you're still here doing it 40 years later um that that's a true test to me i mean because because you got bands that um these days they don't make it past their debut album the fact that you're still out there you still have a strong fan base people are still coming to the show um th- th- that's a true rock and roll survivor you know randy the fact that you guys are still out there doing it and, and anybody who dare say you know oh th- th- this is an old dinosaur band well yeah they got enough people still buying their albums and still coming to the shows you know <laughs> The dinosaur can dinosaur can still rock. <laughs> the dinosaur, the dinosaur apparently is not extinct, you know. So, um, t- to me, like you're saying, if it's a if it's a good band, it's a good band. If um, it doesn't matter, if um, that's why, like back in the '90s, when all these people were throwing away their their rock albums, say, oh, you know, uh, Nirvana is a new big thing. I'm gonna I'm into grunge now. I'm gonna just wear flannel, you know. It, right. It, every ten years, like you say, the metal uh, uh, the scene kind of changes but it's 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 uh, um bands that really survive and are still here um t- to me because um, c- like e- even even the grunge bands eventually kind of died out they're not even as big as they once were but b- the ones that were good they're still here if you know what i mean they're still here yep <laughs> yeah yeah they had some great music well randy jackson's been a pleasure talking to you um this interview is probably going to get posted like um maybe between march and april i'll let you know when it goes up and at, at that All point right. you're more I'll than let, welcome I'll to let um know, Jason. Post interview. Um, do you have any problem with me using um, pulling some photos um, from your Facebook page to use with this? No, not at all. Okay, well, Randy, um, I, I really enjoyed talking to you. And please, um, anytime you have anything to promote, um, let's keep in touch. And I'd love to help. Um, I'd love to do this again. It's been really um, great talking to you. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, man. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good day.